One of the most amazing data structures in computer science, with the most profound consequences, is the hash table. This is also known as a hash map, or in Python we just call it a dictionary. In this video, I'm going to go over the theory of the hash table, what it is, how it works, and the associated algorithms. In order to understand a hash table, you must first understand the associative array. Associative arrays are also called maps, or symbol tables, or dictionaries. In an associative array, the value of the arrays are key value pairs. So we have key value pairs. You can look up a value by its key, or you can assign new values by key. The key is, is that in an associative array, the key must be unique. You can't have two pairs with the same key. Typically with an associative array, we have the following operations. We can get a value by its key. We can set a value for a key. We can also delete an entry for a key. The associative array data structure is really an abstract data structure because it doesn't describe how these key value pairs must be stored. There are several ways of implementing this with the hash table being the most common. However, there are also search trees that you can use that we won't cover here. These will be covered in more detail as I talk about the implementation of the relational databases. There's another way of storing it as well. It's called the associative list. This is a naive way of storing data in an associative array. Let's talk about the associative list. In an associative list, you have an array where each value is a pair with the key and the value. The order of the array isn't very important. Obviously, this takes O, N. Each item in the associative array has to be stored as an element in the associative list. As key value pairs are added, they're just appended to the end of the list. This is an order one operation. However, if you want to overwrite an existing key value pair, you need to find that key in the list. That requires an order in lookup. So it requires order in to set in time, but it's an order one operation in memory. If you wanted to get a value, you'd have to look at each item in the list. So that get time is an order in operation, but it's order one in memory. And if you wanted to remove an entry, you'd have to search the entire list again. Again, that's constant memory. This behavior isn't very bad, but it isn't very good either. This is what an implementation of the associative list in Python might look like. So I'm gonna have a, a function called find by key. It's going to take a list and you're going to have the key in there. And what it will do is it will return the index and the value for that key when it finds the entry. If it can't find it, it'll raise an index error. So we're going to have a for loop. We're going to get the index and then the key comma value. Um, I'm sorry, this is n enumerate over the list s. And then if the key is equal to the key, then we will return that index and the value. And if we run out of items, so the else for the for loop, we're going to raise an index error. With this, it's very easy to implement the get method. So get is supposed to take the sequence and a key and return the value. So we're just, we're just gonna return, if I can spell return, we're going to return the find by key uh, for that list and that key, and we'll return the second value. So that'll be the value that's been returned if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it'll raise an index error, which is what we want get to do. If we're going to set, there's two possibilities here. So we need the sequence, the key, and the value. And for set, we're going to try to find the index and the value by finding that by the key for the set, the sequence and the key. And this is gonna continue up here. So if we don't have such an entry, we will just add it onto the end. So s.append 
the pair key comma value. If we do find it, then we will modify that element to, so that the second item is now equal to the value because the first item is the key. And delete is pretty easy to implement. So we need the key for the, and the sequence and we'll do the same thing. We will IV equals find by key. And then we'll just delete that ith element. Okay. And this is a pretty straightforward implementation of an associative list. Let's talk more about the hash table, about how this is actually implemented. There's two parts to a hash table. You need a hash function and you also need an array. Typically the length of the array is longer than the length of the hash table. So if you have a hash table with 10 elements, the array might be 15 elements long. What we do is we find the index where we expect to find the item based on the hash function applied to the key. And then we take mod of the length of the array. Okay. And so what this does, the hash function takes a key and returns some kind of integer that's derived from that key. And you do mod with the length of the array so that you get an, a value that's between zero and the length of the array minus one. A good hash function will spread the values um, evenly so that based on the different keys, you'll basically have a random chance of hitting any particular spot in the array. Keep in mind though that the hash function must be consistent, meaning if you pass in the same key, it'll give you back the same value. Okay. Sometimes the index for two different keys will be the same, in which case you have a hash collision. And there's two ways to resolve the hash collision that people typically use. One way we used a kind of a reference to an associative list. And the associative list is exactly like I just described. It's a list, it's an array where the values of the array are pairs with the key value, okay? The other way we can resolve the hash collision is with something called open addressing. In open addressing, we look at the position in the, in the array, and if it matches the key, then we use that. But if it doesn't, we look at the next element and the next element until we find an empty element. And if you find an empty element, then we know that that key isn't in the hash table. Let's talk about the behavior of the algorithm. So when we do the get operation, it's going to take the index by taking the hash of the key and doing a mod of the length of the array. And this should be an order one operation. And that gives you the index. And with the open addressing system, it only has to look at a few elements before it determines whether or not that key is actually in the hash table. So this is an actually order one operation in time and it's order one in memory as well, okay? The set operation is very similar. When you go to set a value, again, it's gonna use this algorithm to determine where it should store that, that item. When it looks up the item, if the item's there, it's just gonna update the value. But if it's not, it's gonna keep looking for an empty spot and put it there. So this is also order one in time and in memory. And delete is the same. Again, we're using this algorithm to find out where we should start looking for that element. So it's order one and time and memory. Okay. Let's write some code to describe how we might implement at least some of the general algorithm for the hash table. As before, this generic function is useful in many cases. What we'll do instead though, instead of walking through each item in a list, we're going to start with i is equal to the hash of the key mod the length of s. And then we're going to loop through with a while loop, looking at what's at i. So we're gonna say k comma v is the element at i. So at each element in the sequence, we obviously need a key value pair, okay? If k is none, that means we found an empty spot and this isn't in the, in the hash table. So we will just raise an index error. If k is equal to the key, then we found our man. So we're gonna return 
i comma the value. If it's not there, then we're going to increment i. But we need to remember that we're not going to go past the limits of the array, so we have to take that mod with the length of the array. And we'll continue until either we find an empty spot or we find the key. We might want to add an additional check here to make sure we don't actually go and fully loop through the whole sequence. Ideally, again, the array should be larger than the number of elements we have in the hash table. Getting an element in the array, oh, we have the S and the key we're looking up, is rather easy. We'll just use this find by key method. And S and key, and we'll return the the second element, the value that's returned from that function. Adding a key is fairly involved, and I won't actually talk about the process to increase the size of the array, because in this system, I'm not recording the size of the hash map. So I'm just going to assume that there's room for it. So we're going to add the key and the value. This is a little different because um, if if we were to walk through this and raise an index error, we wouldn't remember where we were. So we have to walk through on our own. So we say i is equal to hash of the key mod the length of that list, the array. And again, while true, we look up the key and the value at that position. If that key is none, then we have room, so we can actually set at that position the key and the value. And then we're done, so we can break out of this loop. If the key is equal to the key, then we just set the value, and we're done. And let's not forget we have to increment i and mod that with the length of the list, okay? So that should do the add algorithm. Again, we're assuming that we have enough room in this. We need to check otherwise. Deleting the key is pretty straightforward. We're just gonna use the same method, find by key, and delete that index. Note that when you delete, you have to shift the items after it down if they should have belonged earlier. So delete is not quite as simple as get. Hash tables are very useful. They're used in many different places. Databases will typically build indexes using hash tables. And these might be indexes that you create with like the create index statement, but these might also be indexes created as part of a complicated query. Hash tables are quick to build, they're fast, and they're very useful. Hash tables are also typically used for caching. So if you have a cache, you'll typically have some key that you use for the cache value to look up the cache value with, and you can have the cache be as big as you need to and it doesn't slow down. You can also use hash tables to describe mathematical sets. In mathematical sets, each item in the set must be unique. There shouldn't be more than one of them. So you can use hash tables to determine what items are already in the set and which ones aren't. And finally, you'll see hash tables used for object-oriented programming. So hash tables will be used both for the attributes of the object and also for the V table, which is uh, used to look up which method should be called when a method is invoked. I'm going to end with a couple of notes on what you want to look for in a good hash function. In all of my time programming, I've never had a chance to write my own hash function, so the likelihood that you ever will is pretty low. So uh, it must be consistent. If it's not consistent, it's completely useless as a hash function. And what consistent means is when you pass in the key, you always get the same value back. So same key means the same value, okay? It should be O1 behavior, meaning if I pass in a big list of, or a big string or a small string, it should behave similarly. Many hash functions aren't, aren't uh, linear in their behavior, but they don't necessarily have to be, but it's nice to have that behavior. Most importantly, it should spread out its values. Okay, uh, typical use case people might test is they might pass in the string A and then the string B and then the string C and see if those numbers spread out in, a, in some meaningful way. Okay, great care is taken to generate hash functions that have this good spreading capability. 
there's lots of different possibilities for the algorithms and many of them actually use a combination of algorithms. Um, and there's a lot of testing that people do with real world values to see what happens. So the one that Python uses is very good. It's known to be a very good hash function. Anyway, guys, thanks for your time. I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like, and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.